Yeah, so first off, uh, Caleb said, uh, I was a student here uh, back in the day, 1998, graduated. Doesn't seem like that long ago, but uh, time's, time's going by. And so, yeah, not too long ago, I think I was sitting where, where you guys are, uh, you know, working my way through, through high school, trying to figure out, uh, you know, what's next, essentially. Um, and so I guess backing up a little bit, I am, I'm a smoke jumper with the Alaska Fire Service uh, right now. That's uh, my home base. And the way uh, forest firefighting works out west is there's not, a, there's not a ton of people scattered around the west. And so you kind of go where it's busy and you pretty much go where they, where they need you. And so even though I'm based out of Alaska, I'll go down um, to the western U.S. if it's busy, you know, Montana or California or Idaho or something, and uh, help out down there. Um, as far as smoke, smoke jumping goes, there's nine bases scattered around the west, kind of one per state, um, between you know Montana and Oregon and Washington and California. And so there's only 400, maybe 450 smoke jumpers in the country, and so that's kind of a uh, that's why there's a lot of movement around and um, just to explain smoke jumping uh, real quick it essentially uh, the smoke jumper role in forest fires is to try try to catch fires when they're small they're you know way out in the back country uh, before they you know become big and become some huge fire you see in the news that are burning down houses and you know become a big huge project that require a lot of manpower and money and time to, to put out so um, our job is to try to, you know, if a fire lookout or a manager, you know, spots a fire uh, way out in the woods that's, you know, 10 miles away from a community but has the potential to maybe get to a, a town, you know, in the next, uh, you know, week or the next uh, two weeks, then that's where we would come in. And so then they, uh, they would uh, launch us and eight of us are going to go out in an airplane and parachute in to maybe, you know, a fire just the size of this, this room right here. Or maybe it's an acre, you know, the size of a soccer field or, you know, a couple acres. And so those eight of us are going to parachute in and they're going to drop us in a bunch of gear and food and water. And then uh, the plane waves us goodbye. And then we just got what we got. And then we look at each other and uh, try to figure out uh, what to do. And we come up with a plan. And, um, you know, sometimes that works and sometimes that doesn't. Uh, one interesting component of smoke jumping is the first person out the door is in charge. And that always changes. It might not be the most senior person. It might not be the oldest. It might just be a second or third year uh, person. And they're, they're in charge and they're, uh, that's kind of their chance uh, to work on leadership and to be a leader. And to, um, they, ha they already have a fire background, but they're essentially, uh, you know, maybe you're going to lean on those uh, older firefighters to, you know, try to figure out what to do. But that, that leadership role rotates uh, throughout, uh, you know, throughout the season. And so you might, you might have never been in charge before, but, you know, you're going out there and you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna run that fire with, uh, with help from, from the rest of the crew. And, um, and that's how we kind of build leadership within our community as far as, you know, we, we try to put people in those positions to, uh, to you know, to, to try to succeed. And, you know... Sometimes, you know, people stumble and, you know, there might be lots of questions, but, uh, you know, certainly, um, you know, not everyone is going to be able to do things, you know, right the first time. You know, most of us, uh, most, most of us don't. And so just being in that position and trying to uh, get out there and, you know, not worrying about failure or success as much, just kind of trying to, you know, do the job and learn is, is really, uh, that's helpful for us. Um, so just to back up a little bit, uh, at Hazen, when I, you know, I was, uh, you know, my senior year was rolling along, and uh, you know, you know, applying for college, you know, trying to figure out what's next. Um, I was, I was pretty nervous about going to college uh, right, right out of here. You know, I'd been in school, like, like you guys, you know, you're in school for a bunch of years, um, and I was, I was a little bit hesitant to try to jump right into more school. And I really wanted to see what else was out there in the world because I didn't know, you know, everyone asks you, oh, you know, what do you want to be? And, you know, what do you want to do? And I just didn't feel like I knew what was out there. And so I, I kind of felt like uh, I didn't want to go to college until I had a better idea of different jobs that are out there and, you know, what, what are um, different, different things I could pursue. 
And so, uh, fortunately, I had some great advice and I looked into um, some internship programs. Um, Sterling College in Crassbury um, had uh, some great uh, guidance uh, for me because they, their students do a lot of internships out, you know, out in the world, you know, trying out different jobs and uh, helping out in uh, different volunteer programs. And so I found this organization called the uh, uh, Student Conservation Association. And um, so they do stuff all around the country uh, with like the Park Service and the Forest Service and you know, fish and wildlife, kind of uh, conservation based like out in the woods. And they do three month programs. You know, you're working with a crew, it's like you know, 17, 18 year olds. You're on a crew maybe for three months, you know, maybe you're uh, you know, counting you know, bald eagles in Glacier Park or you know, working on uh, making hiking trails in Yosemite or you're on a fire crew somewhere. And so they have all these cool positions and uh, they're, these, they're three month positions. They give you a house and food and you just get to experience you know, a different job out there. You're working with biologists uh, in you know, who you know, forest service biologists or fish wildlife biologists, and uh, that for me was a great way to try to you know try out different jobs and and uh, just see see the world a little bit and see what was out there um, before I you know before I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do and um, so I just want to mention that program uh, for you guys that you know maybe looking at looking at uh, trying to you know see see what's out there and and it's a great way to try to you know, to kind of test out different jobs and maybe test out something you think you might be into um, to learn more about it uh, before, you know, maybe before school. And they do have uh, summer, uh, summer programs, I think, for like 16, 17 year olds. Um, and, and then uh, older, you know, as you get older too, they have more like leadership programs. But that's a great organization, um, SCA. And uh, they're connected with AmeriCorps also, which is another kind of volunteer internship based program. That uh, and they do a little bit more, uh, I think, in cities. You know, maybe with, uh, you know, working with communities and other students and um, other positions like that. And um, and then here, right in Vermont, you know, we have Youth Conservation Corps, and uh, I think there's there's other uh, programs I don't probably don't even don't even know of. But uh, I I feel like for me, uh, there's a, I guess there's a there's a lot of different avenues to, to get out there and just kind of see what's out in the world. And I guess that'd be my, I guess, uh, looking back on it, my humble take is, is if you're trying to figure out, you know, what to do, um, and you don't, you know, you're unsure, but yet, you know, you have kind of an idea of a direction you want to take, you know, look at, look at different ways to put yourself out there and to, you know, get out, get out and see if you, you know, if, if that's a good fit for you. And if you like that, you know, that, uh, that job or, or that area of, of study, you know, um, before you, you know, throw yourself at college and, you know, put years into it and then realize uh, maybe it wasn't for you, you know, so it's, it's a good way to, you know, a little taste or a little appetizer just to see, um, see if that's something, something you like. So, um, so I did, I did a student conservation association. I was on a fire crew in Mississippi uh, for three months and then they initially trained me up in wildland fire which really is, there's not a lot of training. It's a couple weeks of classes. There's a, a, a pack test you have to take with a 45 pound pack. And all, then all of a sudden you're certified to go on a wildland fire. It's pretty quick. <laughs> and so I was 18, you know, I was like, oh wow, I can, you know, I can go on a forest fire. And I came back to Vermont. Uh, the Vermont Forest Service uh, sends out fire crews out west if it's really busy out west. And um, you know, they're having a, a fire season in Montana or California or something. And uh, so, I went out on, a, on a, some fire crews through the Vermont Forest Service um, out to Montana in 2000, uh, in, in 1999 and in 2000, just part time. I was mowing lawns, you know, I was working around here just doing summer jobs, golf course and stuff. And then they'd call me and be like, oh, can you be in Rutland, you know, in, in two hours? And I'd hop in my little, you know, rusty pickup and bomb down to Rutland and then, they'd, you know, you'd go out west for uh, three weeks and then all of a sudden you're on, you're on this you know, huge forest fire, this, you know, this fire camp is you know, 1,500 people and it's a tent city and there's caterers, you know, there's this whole kind of, uh, it's a little bit you know, like, the, like the military, there's this whole uh, structure that's built up to, to fight these huge forest fires. And so that's initially kind of how I got my, my feet wet in the uh, kind of um, learning about forest fires and it's, you know, it's a lot of hard work, you're out there working in the woods, uh, cutting fire line 
and, um, and then you know mopping up after the fire goes through and you're supporting you're supporting uh, more highly trained crews out there and so I did that for a couple seasons and then um, you kind of learn I guess the the structure of wildland fire and so there's the part-time crews that I was on and then there's these full-time crews called hotshot crews which are the same 20 people together all summer long uh, that go from fire to fire to fire to fire and they're kind of the they're kind of the backbone of the wildland fire world and so that's a full-time job that you do all summer and you're, you're with the same group of people all summer so you can imagine you, know, you get really close to these people everyone has their uh, their niche that they do you have your job you're running a chainsaw you're running a hand tool maybe you're a supervisor and uh, so I, I eventually got on a full-time hotshot crew in uh, California in Sequoia Park and I uh, did that for a handful of years until I applied uh, to be a smoke jumper in Alaska and then um, that's how I ended up up in Alaska so uh, yeah and I've been up there for 15 years and um, I guess uh, what keeps me coming back to it is it's really uh, it's kind of a forced adventure, I guess, in a, in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, as far as you get out in the woods and you end up in a lot of places you wouldn't ordinarily end up in, and um, yeah, you get to see a lot of uh, country and you get to work with uh, wildland fire, which is kind of this incredible uh, force of nature that we think we you know can control sometimes, but really just you know just like a hurricane or an earthquake, I think it's gonna kind of gonna do what it wants to do most of the time. Um, I think I will stop there and now we can, we can move to the next phase of this, I feel like. So this is a great time, everyone, to start asking questions. And I'm going to say, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Other parts of California. Uh, I was based in Sequoia Park, which is kind of a central, sea, central eastern California. And, um... California, as far as forest fires go, the northern part of California usually, you know, burns, um, you know, September, October is kind of their fire season, and then it kind of spreads south down to, you know, LA and all those Angeles forests and all those you know, forests down there. So you kind of, you kind of, you're, you're moving all over, really, um, you know, to all those national forests there. Yeah, I lived in San Francisco. We had a fire really close there, and I was wondering if you were part of the team there. Okay. Uh, Probably not, but I mean, you know, there's a chance. But uh, yeah, there's there's tons of fires. California, really, the 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 western forests are made to burn. Really, it's part of the ecology of of the western forests um, out there. And so, yeah, there's you know, tons of fires every year. And um, one thing that took me a while to realize, but it's I guess something something to keep in mind. Uh, you know, growing up here in Vermont, of course, I had no idea, you know, about forest fires and you know what they all. Um, what, what they're all about, but you know, we we have like great lush, you know, forests here. You know, it rains all the time, of course, and uh, you know we have a lot of rot and decay. Uh, you know, the western forests are super dry, and they, they they have hardly any rain, and so fire really is is rot in the west. Fire takes the place of rot. Um, there's not much decay. You know, if a tree falls down, you know, western forest, it might just be this dead tree on the ground for 20 years. And so uh, those western forests need fire to break break down all that you know the dead the dead material the, the, the brush and undergrowth and uh, put that back in the soil. So um, yeah, they're part of definitely the ecology out west. Uh, other questions? Eileen, um, what percentage are women and what percentage are men who do this job? Uh, there is, I think it's about. I'm gonna. I want to say it's maybe eight to ten percent women. The numbers are, I think, slowly going up. Um, we did have a handful of women uh, at the Smoke Trumper base for a while, and they've uh, since moved on. But uh, certainly, there's more and more women, I think, uh, in the f uh, forest fire field in general. And there was an all an all female crew I saw this year up in Alaska. That was pretty neat to see. That was. Um, a 10-person crew that was put together and I think actually uh, Student Conservation Association also had a I think all-female fire crew also which is pretty neat so um, not a lot but it's yeah it is it is growing um, certainly uh, possible 
Uh, question, Sean took off. Other questions? Uh, yeah. What's the most uncomfortable part of the job? Ooh, uh, the most uncomfortable part of the job is, I would say, sitting in the airplane going to a fire. You got a ton of gear on, and I brought some with me, and hopefully we can uh, dress someone up if someone wants to. And so you're sitting in the airplane, it's super noisy, the seats are just like bench seats, uncomfortable, and you got your harness on, you got all this gear, you're wearing about 100 pounds of gear. You got a parachute on your back, you got another parachute on, on your front and your gear bag, and uh, you know, it's super hot and noisy, and so you know, you're just basically rumbling along, you know, thinking about um, you know, what's coming, and you don't really know, you know, it's really unexpected as far as what you're gonna roll up, what kind of fire you're gonna roll up to, you know, maybe it's tiny, or maybe it's, uh, you know, rolling over the hill and, and you got your work cut out for you. Yeah? Uh, how long uh, are you out there? Um, you're out there for essentially as long as it takes, but up to two weeks usually. It might only be overnight. You know, if it's a little lightning strike and it's one tree, maybe there's four people get uh, put on that fire and you can put it out, you know, you can put out overnight, clean it up the next day, and then you know call for a ride out of there. But um, if it's a bigger fire, you know it takes more work. Maybe you have to bring in more people. Then you could end up being out there for a few weeks, and so you don't know. So it's tricky because you know you're trying to you, you need to bring enough you know enough supplies um, to try to you know plan to be out there for a while. So you kind of you kind of end up um, getting pretty good at not needing a lot and just you know kind of using what you got and. Um, you know, you can order, you're ordering more food and water and everything, but pretty much, uh, you know, extra socks, extra whatever, you know, toothbrush and all that, you know, you got all your personal gear with you. Uh, questions? More questions? Yeah. Where do you sleep? You're sleeping, um, in Alaska, you're sleeping uh, in tents, uh, just sleeping bags, you know, on the ground. Uh, you're basically camping out, you know, out in the woods. Um, but uh, yeah, everyone's, everyone's in tents. Out west, well, there's no uh, mosquitoes, and it's usually pretty dry. You can just sleep under the stars, you know, maybe throw a pad down and a bag, and uh, you're good to go. But uh, in Alaska, mosquitoes uh, can get pretty bad, and so it's pretty much, um, you're pretty much tenting up. We do do a tent flip every year, so if you win, uh, you have to go without a tent all year. And so you have to, uh, you have to get creative and uh, make, make your own... Uh, little hoots to sleep in and there's a lot of parachutes you know from all the gear they drop us and so you have to kind of construct like a little you know hobo kind of uh, parachute tent and uh, you know some are better, better than others but it's a uh, good practice and you know kind of uh, being creative and uh, trying to survive out in the woods and it's always entertaining uh, to see what people come up with and uh, yeah some are, some are worse than others yeah have you ever have you had to do this once uh, yeah, as a as a rookie, as a new guy, you you do have to. Everyone has to try it, so you kind of know what you're getting into. And sometimes, you know, if it's super late, you know, you work until two in the morning, you're too lazy to set up a tent. Also, so maybe just you know, throw a you know parachute over you. And if it's windy and you're like out on the coast, way in like Western Alaska, uh, maybe the bugs aren't too bad, and so you know you can just kind of you know like crash out. But uh, yeah, it all it all kind of depends. Or you can just tie it up to a tree. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, you can just tie, you know, tie something up. You can, yeah, rig up whatever you want. You know, it's it's your chance to it's your chance to be creative. Um, there are parts of Alaska where there's no trees. It's just tundra for like 50 miles, and so that's where it gets interesting when you got when you don't have as much to work with. But uh, other questions? Yeah. Mod Sounds like you don't have much work to do in the winter and the spring. Yeah. What did you do with all your time? Did you did you get opportunities to do something else that was not cool or anything? All that, all that free time, yeah. Um, so yeah, the schedule pretty much is, you know, March to September or October. Um, and then I would still come back here to Vermont and uh, help out uh, my brother on his farm back here. And I've been uh, trying to figure out how to build a house for the last decade or so. Um, and so there is, the, and there is a, a lot of free time and that's one thing that ha kept me doing the job is it gave me a chance to kind of explore other interests that I had. Um, earlier on in my 20s I did a lot of traveling, um, you know, just checking out other places. Uh, you know, you get done work, all of a sudden you don't have all this money earned in the summer and you're like, alright, I'm going to, you know, go explore Brazil or I'm going to go to Europe, you know, or something. So it enabled me to, uh, you know, check out other, other things that I was interested in, um, traveling or 
or volunteering or you know seeing other parts of the world. So that that was neat having that freedom as well. Yeah. Question? Yeah. Um, you never quite know. So the siren goes off. We got six minutes to suit up and get on the airplane, and then uh, you're sitting there waiting for a few minutes as the, you know the plane takes off, and then they pass you back a note. And sometimes it could be ten minutes away, and sometimes it could be three hours away. And I mean, Alaska is you know a gigantic state. It's amazing. You can uh, you can be rolling along for hours in this airplane, just bumping along. You know, it's like the size of a school bus with wings essentially, and. Uh, and you might all of a sudden they're like, oh yeah, we got to refuel in Galena and we got to keep going because the fire is way out in the Seward Peninsula, which is like you know way western Alaska, and it just feels like you know you should be in Russia by then, but you just you're you're just going west forever, and uh, yeah, and then um, you know eventually you get there, but uh, yeah, it could be could be a long time, could be definitely three or four hours. Yeah. Uh, what's the training like that you gotta go through? Uh, the the training initially uh, the the training uh, really tough to to get into smoke jumping, and then every year. We have to um, we have to retrain as far as parachuting goes, and you know just kind of getting our our, um, our bodies and our minds back into um, the muscle memory of, of parachuting. So you know we'll, we'll go off a zip line initially and practice uh, different procedures, and just as far as firefighting in general goes, you know it's a lot of a uh, lot of hiking and you know a lot of physical labor. So you know trying to stay in shape. You know you're you know during the off season, um, just you know generally taking care of your body. And you know, running or hiking a lot and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, what's the biggest fire that you uh, The biggest fire I was on was a. This year, actually, probably it was three fires that were burning together, and it was about a half million acres, and there were it was enveloping this little town of like 40 people. It was like uh, you know East Hardwick, and these huge fires were just coming at this little town from from all sides, and uh, they all kind of burned together into a half a million acres, which is. Uh, kind of a, it's it's hard to even, I guess, imagine uh, this the this, this scope of a half million acres. But uh, Vermont, I believe, is 10 million acres. I I, I think Vermont's 10 million acres. So you picture, you know, a, a 20th of the, this whole state, uh, you know, is one fire, um, which is, uh, you know, yeah, this county at least, or a couple counties. But anyway, um, yeah, there's definitely... Uh, quarter million acre fires and half million acre fires and and they you know once a fire gets to a certain size there's no pretty much there's no way you know anyone's going to put it out it's just going to be the weather the rain and the snow in the fall that's going to take care of it and uh each year the average each year uh for the for the u.s six million acres burn and there's sixty thousand fires a year in this country and um that's pretty that's been pretty steady uh, throughout the years and so yeah that's you know that's just kind of uh the the way of the way of fires really in the west and so you know it's it's the perception sometimes that the fires are this bad natural disaster that you know we need to we need to stop and put out but really you know they're there's something that is that they always be there and it's ongoing and um, they're just kind of another kind of component of of I think uh, you know of, of nature and of, of ecology, and the the tricky part of the equation is really that there's a lot of people who live in communities out west, right next to fires, and so that's that's where I guess you know firefighters come in and where I guess we try to do the most good. Yeah. So. If you were to think about it. Couldn't you just run through the trees, like, in between them and not just, you know what I mean? Not, and not, uh, cut them? Not, what do you say? Yeah, like, instead, like, to get out of there. Oh, if you're trying to... Couldn't you just go through the trees and, like, go through the ones that aren't burning yet? Yeah, if you're trying to escape from a fire? Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um... Yeah, fires really, they burn in a mosaic. It's not really, like, a continu there is continuous fire, but, uh... Yeah, if you're trying to get out from a fire, the best thing to do is go upwind, because really wind is a huge driver of forest fires. And there's definitely there's patches of fires that aren't going to burn. You know, maybe it's rocky. Maybe there's not much uh, understory. And so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's what animals do. That's exactly kind of the uh, natural way of things is they're going to go upwind and they're going to go between the trees and through the rocks and all that and try to hide one way or another. All right, so let's put someone in some fire gear real quick. Is there any volunteers? I vote, I, I vote this one. I volunteer. <laughs>
Oh, here? No, I this one. Yeah. You two? How about you two? <laughs> yeah. Well, you're good. You're perfect. You, you two? You good? I need some. You want? You want to do it? All right. We can. Get, we could uh, do a few different people, but have, okay. You two. Let's do you two. Who's first? You want to go first? All right. <laughs> um. Let's go. Let's see. I guess we should go out here. All right. <laughs> But a lot of both. Oh, this guy's cut. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, uh, all right. So, a couple things, um, real quick. So, you got, you, she's got a, her jumpsuit on, Kevlar, try to protect her. If she's crashed through the trees or there's rocks or something, try to give you a little bit of protection. There's knee pads, there's all kinds of pads. Pretty much all we have is what we're carrying when we get out there. So ordinarily you have your tent, there's a big pocket in your butt. So you have your tent back there, which is good. It's good cushioning actually. And then um, you got maybe some cold weather gear in these pockets. You got a 150 foot let down rope in your right pocket in case you get hung up in the trees and you got to rappel down out of the trees. So you could be dangling there 100 feet up, you know, in some tree. And uh, you have to tie off to your chute. You have to disconnect from your chute, tie yourself to the tree, and then rappel down. Uh, you try to avoid that if possible, because it's kind of a tenuous situation, and it's definitely one of the ways to get really hurt, uh, because you might hit the tree and not hang up, and then you're just falling to the ground. Um, this is your personal gear bag that you're going to use when, once you hit the ground and you go to fight the fire. It's maybe 20 or 30 pounds. So it's clipped. There, there are clips actually out there. So it's right here, ordinarily. And then also, above this, you got a reserve parachute right here going out. And that's another 20 pounds. And then on your back, you have your main parachute, which is about 25 pounds. So as you can tell, you become a, a more fat penguin uh, pretty quick. And so, you know, you're pretty much you're just waddling around. You can't move very fast. And you're just hot and uncomfortable pretty much. And, you know, you just want to kind of uh, get to the ground and get it off at, at some point. And so it's a lot of weight to deal with. And um, how's it feel? I like it. All right. So your green handle. So when you when you, uh, you you jump out of the airplane, the spotter gives you a briefing. You figure out where you're jumping into. That you know, oh, nice little green meadow. You know, just uh, on the tail of the fire. Everyone's in agreement. Then uh, uh, when the time comes to jump out, the spotter slaps you on the back. You go out, and then with your right hand, you pull your pull the green handle. Boom, and then that is your parachute hooked up to these rings here, and that essentially opens up your parachute. And then you look up at your parachute, you're like, you check it out, make sure it's good. You're like, all right, I got a good parachute. And then you grab the steering, steering lines, and then you essentially are, you have this wing over your head. Essentially, you're flying your parachute. Um, nice, you know, flying on in, little pattern, nice uh, in the ground. This handle is your emergency handle. So if there's something wrong with your main parachute and you pull that one, you can pull that one too. So, um, yep, that one's a little bit tougher to pull. And so that, so now you have two, then, you, then at that point you're just throwing those handles away because you're in your emergency procedures. So that, this orange handle, <laughs> nice, that's perfect. <laughs> that orange handle disconnects your main parachute from your harness. And as that main parachute is, um, cutting away from your harness, it, it, pull, it automatically pulls out your reserve parachute right here. And then that opens up whoosh, over your head and, uh, you know, Velcro. And then, so then you have, it's a little smaller, it's a little sportier. And then that, that reserve parachute opens up and then you're flying that to the ground. Um, and that doesn't happen too often, but it's definitely a possibility uh, for sure. And so it's something, you know, you got to practice for a lot and, you know, you're jumping out of an airplane, so time is of the essence. And you got to know what you're going to do if there's a problem. And, and so that's, uh, that's how the handles work. And that's pretty much the gist of it. Uh, questions, on, questions on gear? Other questions in general? Yeah. We, Evan, I think we probably have time for one or two more. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Yeah. Have you ever had to use your reserve parachute? I have not ever had to use my reserve parachute. <laughs> uh, it's not super common. Maybe once or twice a year of, you know, out of all the smoke jumpers. Maybe someone has a someone has an issue, but yeah, not super common. It's a pretty it's a pretty uh, safe system. 
um, that we use um, as far as uh, you know that goes. And I mean, it's really all about buddy checks is what it comes down to. There's a lot of checking, a lot of trusting the people you're working with, and um, yeah, yeah. That's it. Um, last one more question. Yeah. What do you do if both your parachutes malfunction? If both your parachutes malfunction, you hope that one of them is open enough to slow you down, and then. Maybe you know, maybe you're over water or something. But yeah, that's that's pretty much where the rubber meets the road right there, and you're gonna get hurt real bad. Double malfunction is uh, not a good situation. Uh, last question. Anyone else? Any more? You, you had a question earlier. Uh, yeah. So, do you plan on just continuing this, doing the same thing until you retire, or is there a less physically demanding? Uh, something you're going to slide into years down Yeah, the there's definitely other jobs in Wildland Fire, and I think like a lot of careers, you know, you can get in and, you know, do one thing, and then, you know, you can kind of work your way up the ladder or across the ladder into different positions, uh, you know, once you get familiar with one job. And so there's definitely, you know, management jobs that people do that people slide into. Some people do make it, you know, a whole career and go 20 or 25 years until like 57 and a half is when the government uh, kicks you out. Uh -huh for arduous, arduous duty. Um, or, you know, you can go the other direction and just do part-time, not smoke jumper stuff, but just, you know, as far as like fire goes. So yeah, I'm, I'm at a interesting point right now trying to figure out what's next, but um, there's definitely options, I think, like, like, in, uh, like in most professions where you can go in uh, a lot of different directions, kind of what, you know, what suits your fancy. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. All right. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.